Stop it. <laughs> all right, since you're all so cooperative, I actually, um, on my way in tonight, after dinner, I, I stopped by Price Chopper. I got a Kit Kat, a Snickers, and a Twix. Three candy bars, or you can share and make it four. So anyone want a um, Twix? All right, I'm throwing it this direction. If you're in between me and a hand in the back, because I can't see anything, be careful. I'm sorry if I hit someone in the face. <laughs> All right. Um, Kit Kat, we're going second row. All right. That was, we'll pretend like that was caught, because you can't see anyway. <laughs> Snickers. We're going this way. You guys always get ignored because everything happens over here, so I don't know what's going on. <laughs> All right, now. <laughs> Calm down. Calm down. All right, hey, I have, um, before we get into our scripture, I have uh, some fun facts, some believe it or not, and I actually looked these up on the internet, and so because of that, I know them to be true. <laughs> um, all right, so here they go. I don't know how many I have. I have like a list. Lobsters don't grow old and die. In fact, as far as scientists can tell, they only die of external causes. Right? <laughs> there are more possible iterations of a game of chess than there are atoms in the known universe. It's called the, anyone know? The Shannon number. You're welcome. There are more confirmed deaths. And again, this was on the internet, so it has to be true. More confirmed deaths from drowning in molasses than from coyote attacks. 21 people died in the 1919 Boston molasses disaster. I remember it well. <laughs> Only two fatal coyote on human attacks have been confirmed. Eating a polar bear liver will kill you. Humans can't handle that much vitamin A. My paper says A, and A and K aren't next to each other. Uh, a funny, funny note, I hope you think it's funny because I do. When I typed that the first time, uh, liver was lover. <laughs> so I first, when I was reading through, eating a polar bear lover will kill you, it still applies. <laughs> at lunch, no, at launch, it's dark. The iPhone, when it launched, had the same computing power as NASA did in 1969 when it launched the historical manned mission to the moon. That was kind of cool. You carry that in your pocket. Um, raise your hand if you had one of the chocolate bars. The average chocolate bar contains eight insect parts. Cool. <laughs> Who got what parts? If you, if you had, this one is neat. This one is neat, and I think some of you will try to say it's false. I don't know. If you had a straw long enough, you could only suction water upwards the length of 10 meters. After that, the water spontaneously boils. Who's going to go home and try that? All right. Uh, there's two more. Two more. Alpacas can die of loneliness. When bought, they always need to be bought in pairs. Right? Oh. All right, last one. And this one kind of like, uh-uh. And then, oh, yeah, that is true. If you do not have a child you will be the first in your direct lineage all the way back to Adam to not do so. <laughs> Think about that. If you don't have children, you are breaking like this thousands of year streak. So it all comes down. I can't see you, so I don't know how to take your laughter. It all comes down to whether or not you believe. It is your belief, and this is where I get back into the Bible, it is your belief or unbelief that makes the difference. Now, Nathaniel last week covered this giant chunk of really deep stuff about being grafted into and out of Israel. He talked about vines and olive trees and strong roots and branches and all that kind of stuff. His passage and all of the blessings, um, his passage and all the blessings talk about this grafting and talk about the Jews remaining in Christ and about Gentiles being added into the blessings that have been promised throughout Scripture. It all comes down to belief or unbelief. This is, this is hard stuff for us to understand. I know my small group talked about this a lot, um, my, uh, whatever night they came over to my house. Um, th this stuff is hard for us. It's hard for churches to really get a hold on. Churches argue about some of this stuff all the time. 
Uh, I imagine this stuff was really hard for Paul to write, too. Think about that. Paul writing these things and, and kind of making these bold statements from God, but he's making these statements to these people. This is eternity stuff. This is a big deal. And, and these people that he's writing this to and, and everyone who's going to read it afterwards, which includes us, they have to understand this. They have to get this. They have to take this message that Paul has for them, and they have to take it to heart. And so we come to this week's passage, Romans eleven thirty three through 36. Oh, the depths of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable fathomable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who became his counselor? Or who has first given to him that it might be paid back to him again? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. To sum that up, Paul sits back in his chair and he's like, wow. God, you are freaking awesome. Paul's been so deep into this, this Romans letter that he's writing. And then he just, like I said, I can just picture him leaning back in his chair and like taking a breath and just allows the bigness of God just to kind of drip over him. Now, the middle of this section, uh, two of the four verses are actually a quote from Isaiah. And I'm going to read a section out of Isaiah chapter 40, verses 12 through 14 for you. Who has measured the waters of, in the hollow of his hand? and marked off the heavens by the span, and calculated the dust of the earth by the measure, and weighed the mountains into, in a balance, and the hills in a pair of scales. Who has directed the Spirit of the Lord, or as his counselor has informed him, with whom did he consult, and who gave him understanding, and who taught him in the path of justice, and taught him knowledge, and informed him of the way of understanding? In this passage here, Paul quotes it fits so well here when Paul says, like, wow, from him to him, all things. Uh, and then this, in Isaiah, he just, Isaiah's throwing it out there. And it was convenient that we just heard from Isaiah and we heard Jesus looking up in the scroll of Isaiah. Um, this chapter, the whole chapter there that Paul is directing people to, it's full of some pretty good stuff. It's, it's like a little treasure hunt. You get to find these little, little jewels throughout that chapter. Uh, if you go and look in the chapter, you'll find all these uh, it's talking about the whole greatness of God, and I know that because I read it and because the heading on my Bible said so. The greatness of God is what this chapter is about, and that's, that's kind of cool. Uh, this chapter is quoted when John the Baptist comes on the scene. A voice is calling, clear the way for the Lord in the wilderness. Make smooth in the desert a highway for our God. This is the chapter that's even alluded to by Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount when he speaks of the shepherd tending his flock. Isaiah dated his own work when he wrote, as he was writing, he was talking about uh, King Uzziah. And then in chapter 6, he says the year that King Uzziah died. And we know from a bunch of other documents that that was around 740 B.C. And so we know exactly when Isaiah is writing this. And that's nearly 800 years before John threw on his camel skin sash and wandered around the desert with a plate full of locusts. It's nearly 800 years before Jesus came to the earth and talks about being the good shepherd. Paul points his readers to this passage in Isaiah to show the greatness of God. Paul steps back here from this deep theology that he's, he's sending out to the church in Rome, uh, and this difficult topic of their eternal salvation, and he just throws a few words out, kind of a, a praise and worship session, to remind people that God is good. <clears throat> Paul reminds the people of this, this well-known writing. Uh, back then, the Jews, they relied heavily on the law and prophets. Uh, they relied on the law, the Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. I had it written down, didn't even need to look. Uh, and, and they also relied on the prophets, of which Isaiah was one of the main, main prophets. Uh, like I said, Paul points us to this chapter about a voice calling out to prepare a way for the Lord. He points us to uh, Jews, uh, points this to the Jews that are reading, they would know what's going on. The Gentiles, maybe they've, as they come into Christianity, they're going to hear this because the Jews, talking about Jesus as they became Christian, they're going to point to these chapters that, hey, actually, he is the Messiah because God wrote about it in our prophets and in our law like 800 plus years ago. This chapter tells us, uh, from Isaiah, tells us in verse 11 about a shepherd who would tend his flock 800 years before the shepherd came to tend his flock. It asks us questions to ensure that we get a better grasp of God's bigness. Did any of you here help God measure out the waters? Did any of you help weigh the mountains before they were put in place to make sure they were just the right size? Did God check with any of you to make sure that he was doing things right? Isaiah chapter 40, 28 through 31. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord 
The creator of the ends of the earth does not become weary or tired. His understanding is inscrutable. He gives strength to the weary, and to him who lacks, might he in, increase his power. Though youths grow weary and tired, and vigorous young men stumble badly, yet those who wait for the Lord will gain new strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not get tired. They will walk and not become weary. Paul had to be tired. Life had to have him down. I mean, just writing these things and thinking these thoughts had to be wearing on him. He had gotten beaten. He had gotten thrown out of town. He would gotten beaten some more. Exhausted from writing these things. I imagine this, this tired old man sitting in this just simple room, you know, just a, a simple chair, a little table with a candle on it, writing these letters out. Late into the night, his body aching, his hands sore. Maybe as he shifted in the chair, some of those scars hurt. Maybe his muscles and his bones are still healing from getting hit with rocks. Maybe a movement just kind of pulled funny and he has to keep adjusting the way he's sitting in the chair. You know how when you've got an injury that isn't quite healed up and you just can't quite get comfortable? Think of Paul. How many times had he been beaten? How many times had he been stoned? How many miles had he walked? How many of you don't even like walking to class? Maybe Paul copes with the pain in his own battered body by remembering the faces of those that before Jesus met him on the road, he himself sent to jail. He himself commanded that they be beaten or killed. He knows what they're going through. He, he can see those faces. I imagine he's, he's just in anguish. He says throughout scriptures times that he's in anguish for his people. He was tired. He knows what this jump means for them, and he knows how much of a jump it will be for them to go from whatever their life is into understanding these things that he's been writing for almost all of the first 11 chapters, minus this little section of praise at the end of chapter 11. This is one of those moments of rest that we read about in Matthew chapter 11. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus quotes God's words to the prophet Jeremiah here when he said that, that's recorded in Matthew. Things get hectic, they don't always go the way that, that you want them to. You get tired, you want to duck back under the blankets, you want to escape, you want to forget the things that have happened, you want to forget the things that you've done. Sometimes you just want to quit, you want it to stop you get to the point where you simply don't think you can handle anything else, and then God comes in here, for Paul anyway, and reminds him, hey, I got you. God pierces the darkness and chaos of our lives like this candle can cut through the dark. Oh, the depths of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable are his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord, or who became his counselor? Or who was first given to him that it might be paid back to him again? For from him, and through him, and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Paul stops here and he breaks out in a time of worship. This is a doxology. What's a doxology? It's just a liturgical formula to praise God. It's also a song that some of you might know. It's a formula to praise God, liturgical formula. What is liturgical? What is liturgy? It's a formula by which we conduct public worship. So Paul is falling back on what he knows, the, the ceremony of the Jewish synagogue, the worship that he grew up with in the synagogues, in the church, and he just sits back in his chair and praises God. Paul stops this writing, and he reflects on the grafting he reflects on the theology. He reflects on the Lord. And he just worships. I can just imagine him sitting there and, and all of those aches and pains for that, that moment, just for that moment, they, they fade. His wounds, his, his physical wounds, his mental wounds, his emotional and spiritual scars all just sort of stop. Just for this moment, as he writes this letter to the church in Rome, he sits back in his chair, I think, and it stops. 
You see, these trials, these struggles that make him who he was, his mistakes, they've shaped him. They've helped develop the man that sat there and wrote these words, that sat there and dictated these words. Sometimes we need to stop and take a breath and just remember through our pain, through our struggles, through our scars, through our hurts. Remember God the way that Paul does here. Oh, the depths of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who became his counselor or who has first given to him that it might be paid back to him again? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Some of you may be familiar with that song, the doxology, that a lot of churches, anyone, hands? I can see movement, but that's about it. Um, I've actually asked Ben to help me, and the words are going to be on the screen. The words are going to be on the screen. Um, When they come up on the screen, I thought it would be super cool to sing this together, no instruments, and just let our voices ring and just kind of take a second and praise God. So I'm going to tell you the words, and then Ben will, hey, and then Ben will, um, Ben will kick us off because no one wants me to do that. So the words, praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him above, ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Thank you. Sometimes we have to remember that God is here. Sometimes we have hurt because we messed up. Sometimes we have hurt because someone else messed up. Sometimes we can understand that because of this situation, we're able to learn a lesson. Sometimes when we we feel these pains, these memories that just won't stop, playing over and over in our heads. We find nothing but darkness and despair, and and we feel nothing but lost and alone. Sometimes there is no answer, but there is God. You may not feel that way. Maybe you feel like there's no way that this father, you know, the one that everyone sings about being a good, good father, there's no way that this God that let this stuff happen to you could be a good, good father. There's no way that he could love you. He must hate you because of the way that he ignores you. You might believe he's real. You might believe everything the Bible says, but you just can't accept that he is a good, good father. You don't know what that is. My prayer for you is the hard road. You can't undo what's been done. You can't forget the things that you've done, the things that have happened to you. You struggle to not feel empty. My prayer for you is that you will see God and that you will see good, that you can lean back in your chair and just let it go. Don't forget, but let it go. That's what Paul had to do here. After the life that he lived, the mistakes he made, the things that were done against him, He could have been a very angry man. He could have lived out his days in anger, in fear, alone. But Paul let it go. Paul had pain. Paul struggled. Paul did some flat-out evil things. He had people attack him. He was physically hurt. He was abused. He was left for dead. Tonight, here, I pray that you can follow his lead. Let all of that go. Let your scars fade away. 
Let your pains stop. Let your, your worries just halt. And for just a moment, just a few moments, let it go. Lean back in your chair and praise him. Take a rest. Be free. God didn't ask Paul how to go about being God. God didn't check with me either. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, does not become weary or tired. His understanding is inscrutable. He gives strength to the weary, and to him who lacks, might he increase power. Though youths grow weary and tired, and vigorous young men stumble badly, yet those who wait for the Lord will gain new strength. They will mount up on wings like eagles. They will run and not get tired. They will walk and not become weary. The last verse in this chapter that Paul wraps it up with as he, in my mental image, sits back in his chair and just takes a moment to praise God from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Let's pray together. God, I thank you so much for your love. I thank you for just the strength that you offer us, God, for the fact that you've told us that you'll give us moments of rest. I pray that you would be here tonight with us, God, and help us to just let go of the things that are holding us back. Let go of the things that make us angry, the things that hurt us, the things that just repeat in our minds and stop us from seeing your goodness. God, I pray that you would just touch each one of us here tonight. Help us to lean on one another. God, some of us are doing really good tonight. Some of us are doing really bad tonight. I pray that we would, as a family, as a body of believers, that we would rise up together as one voice and praise you tonight, God, and that you would hear that and you would allow those sounds to touch each one of our hearts and just cleanse us, God. I pray that we would just sing to you with everything we are tonight, God, that we would worship you. I thank you that we can come here together in this room on this campus that we can worship you and we can live a life, God, that you've given us. And I pray that those lives that are represented here would honor you and bring praise to you. Thank you for Jesus, and it's in his precious name that I pray. Amen.